Jim has a DLIT from Oxford, a physics degree, has pioneered in computing, was nominated by Computer World as the fourth most influential person in the history of computing, has done so many things that if I began to summarize them, I'd be taking his precious time. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. James Martin. in front of people like yourselves, and so I hope that you'll forgive my unprofessionalism. The 21st century, I think, is, is going to have a very special place in history, a very, very extraordinary place. And as we look at it today, we can see that the outcome could be magnificent, or it could be a new dark ages. And what happens really depends upon uh, things which happen mostly in the next 10 years or the next 20 years. And it's really important to understand those as thoroughly as we possibly can. And so the reason for setting up the 21st Century School in Oxford is to try and look at the problems, the dangers, the opportunities of the 21st century. Many of them are very complex. And because they are complex, they need scholarship of the highest level possible. So it's the goal of the 21st Century School to set up a collection of institutes on different subjects with the highest possible level of scholarship and then we need to get them to talk to each other because the big problems are all multidisciplinary problems that connect together many different disciplines. And so this is a school which almost everything it does is concerned with multidisciplinary academia. Now the story begins at the beginning of the 18th century when there were men who rode on horseback to each other's homes on moonlit nights. Moonlit nights because there were lots of robbers and they rode to each other's homes because there was a new sort of conversation starting. And that is, could we use machines? Could we invent or create or design machines which would help our corporation to make more profit? And oddly enough, nobody had ever asked that question before, even the Swiss. <laughs> and they invented the, the loom, they invented the spinning jenny with an awful lot of difficulty in trial and error, they invented the steam engine. And uh, the steam engine, I think, changed history more than Queen Victoria. And uh, it's fascinating, when Queen Victoria came to power, she was being uh, advised by her most powerful uh, ad advisors at that time to, to not have an empire, not have colonies, get rid of the colonies. The colonies are an embarrassment. We don't want something like America happening again. And by the time this young girl had uh, reached the end of her reign, uh, about uh, one third of the population of the entire planet was subjects of Queen Victoria. And why did that happen? Well, almost certainly it happened because of technology. It happened because of the steam engine and everything else. But as we started to get technology happening, it fed on itself. And one invention would cause another invention. And you get many inventions, and so you've got an avalanche, rather like an avalanche going down a mountainside. And every year, the m momentum of technology gets greater, and as the momentum gets greater, the tools get more powerful, computers get more powerful, networks get more powerful, and so on, then the next wave of technology is more powerful than the wave before. And as we look at the 21st century, there's no question that this momentum is going to continue. Technology gaining speed, gaining momentum, unstoppable momentum. And so some scientists ask, how long is it going to go on? Can this, will this just go on for another 50 years? Well, today we've discovered so many uh, strange, but potentially incredibly powerful pieces of technology that it's the view of most uh, scientists who look at uh, physics and the theory of physics and what's happening in, in cosmology and things like that, that we're the beginning, uh, we are at the beginning of a very long-term avalanche. This avalanche is certainly going, going to go on for the rest of the century and probably going to go on for many centuries uh, after that. Now, it has byproducts. One of its byproducts is suddenly there was a, an explosion in population, explosion in technology, uh, a sudden explosion worldwide in communications. So you suddenly got global communications, an intense interest in consumerism and uh, global warming, uh, the danger of um, too much global warming so we would damage the planet. In fact, many other dangers like that. <laughs> the creation of the atomic bomb, the creation of other weapons of mass destruction, 
And now as we move into the 21st century, weapons of mass destruction becoming cheap and mass producible and uh, capable of getting into the hands of uh, not government and defense departments, but <coughs> terrorists or lunatics who might use them in very dangerous ways in society. So the 21st century is faced with a lot of problems. There's one big problem, and that is humanity's behavior is far exceeding what the Earth can support with these curves. And so the population is growing too, too much. <coughs> Consumerism is, is growing too much. Uh, the population is probably going to get to about 9 billion. But if you have uh, California-style consumerism <coughs> applying to 9 billion people, you'd have to have six planets in order to support what's going on. And uh, so a planet with very limited uh, resources. Incidentally, I've had the most dreadful flu for the last few days, so if my voice is breaking up or sounds terrible, it's because I've got the flu. Um, anyway, uh, solutions to this. Now, we can have serious events. You know, you look at the possibility of another thing striking in the Earth, like the thing that wiped out all the dinosaurs in this museum. And uh, there's a lot of study of asteroids and when they might hit the Earth. Serious events. But now the serious events, which could do great damage to humankind, are probably not events that are caused by nature, asteroids <coughs> and so on, they're events that are caused by us, like wars. And when that happens, the curve becomes very, very much steeper. So in, in, instead of this curve, you've now got a curve that's becoming like that, perhaps steeper still. And Martin Rees, who's the head of the Royal Society, points out that we now have uh, events that could happen, uh, human-triggered events, which would be worse than an event wiping out civilization. <coughs> we could have an event which wipes out Homo sapiens itself. And so the, the uh, extreme danger occurs of, of possibility we would be out Homo sapiens. Now, as soon as that becomes possible, <coughs> it's absolutely mandatory, I think, to take it very seriously indeed and say, whatever happens, we're going to stop that. Whatever actions we have to take, we don't want to wipe out Homo sapiens because we don't get another chance if we do that. And so this is, these are some of the dangers. I was uh, saying something like this uh, <coughs> in House of Lords and Chris Patton was there. And Chris Patton made a closing speech and he said, uh, Martin talked about the possibility, the very, very remote possibility of wiping out Homo sapiens. But I would like to assure all of you that if we do wipe out Homo sapiens, Oxford University will be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a lot, of, a lot of different types of problems. What Martin is now becoming famous for the very controversial comment, there are certain doors in science which must not be opened. And of course, many other scientists, as soon as they hear it's their particular doors he's talking about. I was talking to uh, Freeman Dyson, and he was saying, because thou art virtuous, my, may I have no cakes and ale. Uh, saying that doors which he's interested in are certainly going to get open. So this is one of the problems that we have. Anyway, the 21st century is special because all, all these things are coming to sort of a crunch point. This is a century when we've got to take these things seriously. We've got to control what we are doing. Otherwise, we're going to be in serious trouble. So to a large extent, what the 21st century school is about is looking at the dangers, looking at the problems and saying, how can we control what we are doing? How can we put appropriate controls, appropriate research into place, uh, stop pandemics raging across the planet uh, out of control, and, and many other uh, things like that? And we can identify um, a number of nightmares of the 21st century. Severe climate change, excessive population growth, water. A lot of people think water is caused by climate change, but it's not. Uh, running out of water is going to be a terrible problem uh, 30, 30 years from now. And to a large extent, it's quite separate from the <coughs> climate change problem. Anyway, a set of problems, what I'd like to do is not talk about them now. I'll come back to that list at the end of the lecture and uh, list the types of solutions, though we won't go into any of the solutions in detail. Otherwise, the lecture would take five days rather than, than one hour. <coughs> I hate doing lectures that take less than five days. Um, <laughs> the population of the Earth is, is growing like that, and the, uh, there are lots of demographers many of them associated with the United Nations, and they were saying that the population would reach its maximum at about 8.9 billion. Now, they're saying that was a bit too optimistic, and they say, they say 9 billion again now. <coughs> so this is one of the concerns. If you have uh, the public, sooner or later, the public in uh, third world countries are going to want cars, and they're going to want air conditioning. 
And when they want cars and air conditioning, that puts a huge strain into the carbon uh, production into the atmosphere, at least if you do it like today's cars and air conditioning. China is building one new power station a week, a coal power station, and Chinese coal is particularly filthy, <coughs> and these are two gigawatt power stations, which means big, very, very big, one really big Chinese power station per week, and that is the single largest uh, problem that we have in looking at global warming. <coughs> um, so you can look at changing your light bulbs or driving a Prius and something like that, and it's totally insignificant compared with stopping the Chinese from building one new power station a week. But how do you stop the Chinese? They're not going to take any notice whatsoever of what we say about carbon sequestration, not unless we pay for it, it's very expensive. They're not going to take any notice of cap and trade systems. So how could you stop the Chinese? Well, only two ways. Only, only, the only way you could do it is by getting other technology for generating electricity which is cheaper than coal. And that basically is the, is the challenge. We've got to find things which are cheaper than coal. So we want to set up in the school a non-carbon energy institute which will be looking at all types of non-carbon energy. But one of the big bottom line goals of that institute will be to say, we've got to find new types of non-carbon energy which are cheaper than coal. What are they going to be? Where, where do they come from? What research needs to be done in order to make those happen? In fact, the, the school was set up about two and a half years ago and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's done amazingly well. And I think it has a, a very high reputation not only in Oxford, I go all over the world and people say, is there anything else like this? Is there any, has any other university got a 21st century school? And the rather surprising answer is no. This is completely unique uh, in, in universities. And I think it's done things which are very interesting in, indeed, some quite wonderful things, but they are only looking at part of the picture. And so what we're trying to do at the moment is to change from first gear to second gear, where second gear is going to be looking into, in a much broader way at the whole picture and saying, what are the really biggest problems and how can we find academics, how can we find uh, institutes that already exist perhaps which are addressing the very big problems so that we can pull these things together and then get a website which asks big questions. What, what, are, what is the meaning of the things we're talking about? What is the meaning of these things in, in the 21st century? And uh, now we can predict the future to a certain extent because many of the trends we look at have a very high momentum. I'd like to refer to them as freight train trends, <laughs> partly because I've been trying to make a film on this. And, and trains always look good on film. And uh, a freight train is something where you can't slow it down quickly or you can't make it turn a corner quickly. Uh, so a freight train trend, uh, you can change it very slowly, but uh, not, not at a higher rate than that. For example, population growth. We can't do anything very quick, or we don't want to do anything very quick about uh, population growth. And if we have too much population, then we have increasing food requirements, food shortages, <coughs> increasing dangers of famine and we can't do too much about that again it's another huge long term freight train trend and uh, there are many of these uh, freight train trends and so some of them are fairly harmful for example every year mankind loses 24 billion tons of topsoil I was amazed in making the film we went all over the planet and quite a lot of places I got people in a single engine plane to fly me over a place where we were and it's amazing how often I got a farmer flying the plane and he would look down, at least look at that soil there. You, you can see the rocks through the soil. That's, that topsoil is about one inch thick. Twenty years ago, that was three feet thick. This is what we're doing to the planet. We're destroying the topsoil. All over the planet, we are getting desertification. And the deserts don't look like the Sahara Desert. They look different from that, but they're desert in that you're reaching a stage where you won't be able to grow food or useful crops. In them. So the spread of deserts, uh, the loss of water, we're creating 50 million acres of new desert each year and pumping enormous amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere all the time, losing 44 million acres of forest. President Butch made uh, a, a big speech about ethanol being the solution for cars and Brazil cheered and started to cut down even more of the tropical rainforests. And uh, Brazil is cutting down a, a size an area of tropical rainforest the size of Belgium every year. In fact, the main thing that Belgium is famous for these days is that Brazil is cutting down tropical rainforests the size of Belgium. And uh, the fish in the oceans, the, the oceans are so huge, you know, you try to 
make a film. We're going to all six continents trying to make a film and do a lot of flying over the oceans. And they're so huge. And it's unimaginable that we've caught 90% of the edible fish in the oceans. But we have. And the number's increasing. It's accelerating. And by 15 years from now, unless we do something serious to change that, there won't be any fishing that makes a profit. The fi fishing industries will become dead uh, around the world. And so we're doing some pretty serious things. Now, the good news is that all of these problems have got solutions. And the solutions are not rocket science. They're not all that difficult from the technical point of view. They may be difficult from the political point of view. So one thing we want to get into the second year of the Institute, and it's probably the most difficult thing. We, we went out for requests for proposals for a new institutes, new activities in the Institute. We thought we might get about six, and we got 60, all from Oxford. And most of the 60 were brilliant. There was an enormous uh, talent, enormous brains, enormous research, enormous desire to help with these problems in, in Oxford itself. But we didn't get one. <coughs> on the subject which we wanted most, a subject very dear to Ian so, and that is, it's clear that American-style government is not working today. The Thomas Jefferson-style government is wonderful in what it did, but it's not working in solving the global problems. And all of these are global problems. They all cross national frontiers. So none of the mechanisms which are actually in place today could save the oceans. You've got to have something different. And there are quite a lot of things which, are, uh, which we could have, which are not all that difficult to put in place. In fact, you could say we know how to save the oceans, and it's much more a global management problem than a technical problem. And this applies to many of the other things. So one of the things that on our list now is to possibly go outside Oxford on our quest to find people who have done brilliant academic research on what are the new management mechanisms that you need in order to control the, the planet. And uh, anyway, lots of different uh, trade vein trends. We extract 150 billion tons more water uh, from the aquifers, the underground aquifers, than uh, are being replenished by rain. Uh, most of the water that we use has been there for a million years. It's like petroleum, it's fossil water. And uh, this was the basis of the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution uh, caused a wonderful increase in food production, but it used an awful lot of water to do it. And most of this water was fossil water. And the quite extraordinary thing is we got these huge underground lakes, but we didn't measure how fast we were using them. So we just used, used up the water without any measurement, without any management in place. And many of those aquifers emptied. And a lot more are going to empty fairly soon. And so this is a, a very serious problem. It's going to cause very bad water shortages. Now, to illustrate that, if you had uh, all the water we're talking about in a, in a convoy of big water trucks, that convoy would be 300,000 miles long every day. And that's 37 times the diameter of the Earth. That's how much water we are using and not replacing from the aquifers. And so, huge, uh, huge problem. Now, we have many other problems like that, and we can put them all together, and they all interlink to one another. It's like weaving a tapestry and I'm not going to talk about all the lines on this chart. I hope you can read quickly. But the point I'm making here is that they all connect together. And uh, so this is the reason why we really need a 21st century school which studies the things which are on this chart. When you put them all together, they're a really formidable problem. But the things which one institute is, is, is studying connects to things which other institutes study. And so getting the, the overall picture and how they relate to one another is very important. And, and often, a large part of the management, you hear people say the same things. The same, same things in Angela and Plains Institute from the things that uh, Sir Nicholas Stone says about global warming and so on. Many things in common. And so there are many solutions, and the solutions lead to just amazing opportunities. That's the logo for, for the school. So the school is trying to uh, identify the solutions and the opportunities which come from those things. <coughs> Angela uh, has just uh, won the most uh, just ex extraordinary thing in life. She's become, she'd been made a fellow, a lifetime fellow of all souls, which is uh, perhaps the highest distinction you can get in Oxford. Only the second woman in history to, to receive that. And Angela's running the Institute on uh, Infectious Diseases, and what, we, what we should do about avian flu if it suddenly starts to take off in a raging pandemic and other pandemics. Susan Greenfield, running the Institute for the Brain. <coughs> and one of the things we 
found there is a, a woman, a small group of people who think that, they, they say that they can uh, uh, stop Alzheimer's within the next 10 years and stop neurodegeneration. And if you can stop neurodegeneration, you stop Parkinson's disease as well. And so this is a long shot, a uh, gamble, but if they <laughs> succeed in doing that, my goodness, what an incredible uh, thing to have achieved. And so that is one of the things that we're looking at. And uh, Diana Liverman looking at uh, climate change, having become very famous all over the world uh, for the activities which are going on. She's just putting together a group of people who will study the uh, rainforests. And uh, uh, as well as cutting down the rainforests, we're also uh, doing actions which is causing the trees to die. If uh, global warming goes up by four degrees, the trees of the Amazon will be dying at a rapid rate. <coughs> And that's important because the trees of the rainforest absorb carbon dioxide and pump out oxygen. Then, if you will, the lungs of the planet. But when the tree dies for a long time, it emits carbon dioxide in, instead of absorbing it. Anyway, there's a wonderful, brilliant group of people. Paul Jeffries in the Horizons and uh, June Chavalescu is very much concerned with the ethics of uh, science and the things which are happening. Uh, William Dutton at the Horizons. Stephen Castles, who's famous all over the world for his uh, extraordinary studies of human migration and worries about, you know, are there going to be a million Africans flooding into Europe in 10 years' uh, time as, as the, uh, the misery in Africa spreads and global warming spreads? And he studied that and, and to some extent the solutions to it in great detail. Nick Bostrom, extraordinary uh, mind looking at uh, the philosophy of what we're talking about, concerned very much with the opportunities of the future. What should humans be like in the future? Steve Rayner running the Institute for Science and Civilization, and uh, Sarah Harper, the Institute for Aging. Anyway, that, that's first gear. And as you can do, if you know any of the people on there, you'll know that that's an extraordinary group of people that are doing quite extraordinary work. And in uh, the center, the sort of orchestra conductor putting it all together, <coughs> we need to have a great website. The website now, it's known all, all the way around the world. It's become a very good website, but it's going to get much better. If you look at the website a year from now, I think it'll be a far more uh, unique and interesting website than the website <coughs> at the uh, present. And uh, now, for every one of these problems, there are powerful solutions. And one of the things that's on our side is global wealth will increase enormously. Most of the new technologies, that, uh, the, 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 the engine of the 21st century, are clean, small, no power, uh, no big chimneys, smokestacks, uh, miniaturized, sustainable, different technologies. And we'll be likely to invent multiple civilizations. Global warming is one of the big problems. Now, for most of the, the big freight train problems, uh, as you look at the solutions, what the solutions are saying is, is if you take action now, it's not going to be too bad. If you're prepared, if you're ready for avian flu, it's going to be okay. But if you don't take action now, then it's going to get very expensive and may become disastrous. So uh, the Stern Report says that in 700 pages. It's the best economic document looking at uh, global warming. And many of the lessons from the Stern Report really apply to the other things that we're talking about. And uh, so uh, as far as possible, we would like to get new energy technologies and uh, there'll be many new types of solar energy. Anyway, uh, again, I want to don't want to go into the details. There's not, not time here. But a lot of different energy technologies. It's probably the case that quite a lot of you in the room don't know the meaning of some of the words on that chart. And what that is saying is that there are fundamentally new technologies which are not well known. It's quite possible that the mass production of pebble bed units will be the cheapest form of non-damaging energy, non-carbon energy, um, if we mass produce pebble bed units in, in very large quantities. I looked at the, this activity in China and did a few calculations, and in order to make a dent in the Chinese coal power stations, you want uh, one pebble bed unit per day, and in order to do that, you need a factory organization. It's rather like the car industry where you have uh, just-in-time delivery of components from the cheapest locations, and those components be put into a production mechanism which can make one pebble bed unit a day. And if China can do that, it can solve, uh, to a large extent, its own problems, and if it does that, it will be solving the other problems in the world. Eventually, China may become the uh, mass production organization that's shipping pebble bed units to the world, and that will be a, a very... Uh, intensely competitive process. There may be other countries which do it before China, possibly. 
And anyway, we're going from um, first gear to second gear. And we've identified eight, <coughs> possibly more than eight. We don't quite know yet whether these will be part of the second gear. We'll have finished second gear by October the 1st, which means they'll be up and running with the management and the, the money and everything in, in place. And one is the Oxford Stem Cell Institute, and that's an extraordinary place to visit. The building is extraordinary. It's where Fleming discovered penicillin. It's where the technology of antibiotics was created for the world. And imagine the good that that did in the world. And can you imagine, with the viewpoint that we have today, is that this incredible new uh, type of medicine, uh, antibiotics, all the different types <laughs> of antibiotics, they never took out a patent. Oh, so Oxford lost all the money. If Oxford had taken out a patent on what happened in that laboratory, it would be the richest university in the world by far now. Also, the first three people to understand how to make an atomic bomb were here in Oxford. And no patent was taken out on that. Churchill took it to Roosevelt. The um, design of radar happened here. And that saved Britain in the Battle of Britain. And we didn't take out a patent on radar. And the technology of radar led to the microwave oven. We didn't take out a patent on, on microwave oven. So we look back at those things now and say, my God, if only Oxford had understood how to use the incredible brains of Oxford to support Oxford financially. It would be by far the wealthiest university in the world. And so as we go forward, we've got to fundamentally change that. A lot of things which uh, John Hood understood very well uh, <coughs> when I first met him. He said to me, if Oxford was really well managed, it would be absolutely the best university in the world. And it was his view that management needs somehow or other to be put into place. Uh, nanostructures in, in medicine, nanotechnology, there are extraordinary different things happening in, in nanotechnology. Future Car Institute, what we will mean by hybrid cars in the future is not anything like the Prius. We will uh, not mean a car with the petroleum. We will mean a car with a very powerful electric motor on each wheel. N no axles, no differential, no gearbox, no, no transmission. All the heavy stuff under the car is, is not there anymore. And there's a mixture of technologies, so hybrid will mean the choice between batteries and capacitors, very high power capacitors, fuel cells, uh, and hydrogen in the car in the future. So all of those things are going to be studied, I hope, by a new group here that will be looking at the, the car of the future and asking the more fundamental question, how, in view of the huge vested interest of the petroleum industry, how do we get the car of the future into uh, wide, wide acceptance? Non-Carbon Energy Institute, a, a very different institute, managing and regulating armed conflict. And the group that are running that uh, are, are people who spent their lives looking at armed conflict. And given the weapons of mass destruction, which are certainly coming into existence, how can you look at situations which might turn into armed conflict and diffuse them, stop it happening before they get to the time when you get armed conflict? So a very important subject for the rest of the century. Carbon in the oceans, um, an extraordinary thing. We, uh, a physicist who's got a really world-class reputation um, understands that you can use an accelerator, particle accelerator, to accelerate protons and neutrons and focus them on a, a cancer, a cancer which is fairly new, and you can focus it on the cancer in such a way that you can kill the cancer very quickly and accurately. So he wants to use physics and create a special type of nuclear accelerator and will then uh, cooperate with medical people. And most of the details of what he wants to do are anecdotal details. Being a physicist, he wants to convert the anecdotal evidence into mathematical, precise evidence in the way that scientists should do. And so that's what he's going to be doing with the goal of creating the most powerful way on the planet of killing cancer. And I think he's going to succeed in, in, in that ambition. Uh, new approaches to global governments, which we talked, uh, talked about a moment ago. Anyway, those are the ambitions. That's why I've been in Oxford for the last three weeks, having a, a great old time with Ian, who's going to be glad to get rid of me, and uh, talking about all of the uh, intellectual capital that we have that we can round up to deal with the problems which are on that list. And particularly important, the, the logo here ought to be always thought of as meaning the very highest level of academic excellence, because these are very difficult problems. And this is Oxford, which has got the academic excellence. There are two types of trend which enable us to think about the future. One is the freight train trend, high momentum that won't change very rapidly. 
And that's what nearly everybody would have talked about until fairly recently. And now you've got another extraordinary trend, and that is instead of constant speed, you've got trends which are constant acceleration, where the acceleration, the same rate of acceleration, goes on for a very long time, 50 years maybe, more, more than 50 years. And this would be like Moore's law, the number of um, transistors on a chip doubling every 18 months or so. And so constant acceleration, like Moore's law, where the capability goes up uh, curves like this as we progress into the future. And so uh, we could list the technologies which are perhaps going to be the most exciting, uh, extraordinary, intellect intensive technologies of the 21st century. <laughs> Incidentally, the technologies which are probably going to be the technologies which will make the most money in many cases. Uh, and he here's a list of them. And uh, they are all uh, sort of tiny technologies, embryonic stem cells. We were looking at a very powerful microscope in uh, this lab where uh, penicillin was invented. And uh, we looked at embryonic stem cells, and you couldn't see much, you know, just a gray mass with dots. Didn't look very interesting. And then he said, OK, here we've got a tiny little wafer. What we've done here is to, the, the thing about an embryonic stem cell is you can convert it into any other type of human cell. And so here's one we've, where we've converted into a blood cell. We look through the microscope and you can see little circles, red circles and white circles, those uh, tiny blood cells. Here, here's a uh, brain. You can look through that and you can see uh, neurons and synapses and connections between neurons. And then, uh, perhaps the most amazing of all, here's the heart. And we look through it and now you can see these embryonic stem, stem cells are turned into something which was a mass which was pulsating, <laughs> like this, like a heart does. And uh, he was saying it's easy to convert embryonic stem cells into heart cells. And if you've got a heart attack where the tissue of your heart is, is dead and you're likely to die in a couple of days with this, we can build new heart tissues for you quickly. We've done that with pigs. And uh, the thing about the pig heart is it's the heart which is perhaps the closest to the human heart. And so... Um, Stem cells is leading to a new type of medicine called regenerative medicine, in which we can regenerate tissue of all sorts of different types. Extreme bandwidth internet. What's the internet, what's the internet going to look like if it has a bandwidth a million times today? What will it do? Um, nanotechnology, extraordinary. So many different fields where nanotechnology can apply. Anyway, there's a whole lot of those, and I don't lecture on that subject, otherwise it'd be a five-day lecture. But let me make one comment about them, and that is they all that Freeman Dyson uses a phrase, which I, th I think is appropriate. He uh, uses the phrase, infinite in all directions. And when you look at nanotechnology, for example, it looks infinite in all directions. We're going to have the capability to build incredible computers with nanotechnology. People are saying, we got to the end of the computer revolution, and Moore's Law is coming to an end with silicon chips. It's, in, in reality, it's only just at the beginning. Uh, 30 years from now, we'll have uh, nanotechnology. One, one of the difficult things about a silicon chip is it's got to be flat because it gets very hot. You've got to draw the heat away from it. But with nanotechnology, you don't have to draw the heat away from it. So it can be three-dimensional. So instead of having a one-inch square chip, you can have a one-inch cube object. And then the individual components are very close to one another compared with the, what they would be on a two-dimensional surface. And so with the one-inch cube, you can probably build something which is a million times the power of the most powerful chips that we have today. And people are saying, we're going to be able to build a, a computer circuitry which is a million times the intelligence of the human brain. Uh, and what on earth is the world going to look like if we have a lot of little components which are one-inch cube components which have got that level of intelligence? But we're likely to be able to build those. And so uh, 21st century technologies, many different ones, all sorts of, some very strange. Quantum entanglement is a, a very strange subject indeed, uh, but very fundamental. And it's probably something fundamental is going to be one of these technologies where we'll see it, its applications improving and improving and improving for uh, probably for more than a century. And uh, in many uh, areas, the greatest fortunes will be made out of the smallest products. <coughs> sure, it's sort of a picture of technology in the 21st century. Now, obviously, if we're going to understand the 21st century, you've got to understand what is on that list. And we've put together institutes for understanding some of them, but not all of them yet. And so as we go into second gear, we'll be you know, strengthening our muscles and the capability to do that with the things that we've chosen. But beyond that, there's third gear 
And I don't think I dare mention third gear in Ian's presence until we've got over the present change that we're going through. This is a carbon nanotube. Those are carbon atoms. A carbon atom has got four links to other atoms. And on that diagram, they all link to other carbon atoms. And that makes something which is extremely strong, stronger than a diamond. And you can um, create a, a rope where you have fibers of carbon nanotubes, which are woven together like that. And that, that rope will be so small, you couldn't see it in a microscope. But it's strong enough to hold up a 20-ton truck. So we can build uh, uh, things of immense strength like that with carbon nanotubes. But probably the most interesting thing about the carbon nanotube is that this, this is just one molecule. So it's very strong indeed. There's one uh, factory in France which is producing those, and it's producing about a ton a day of these things. So this is changing from being a, a very esoteric laboratory experiment to something which is going to be mass production. It's sort of dangerous in mass production because they could go through anything. You, you couldn't make a box which would hold them. They'd, they'd get through almost any substance. So the only way you can ship them is by creating a liquid where you've got a module in the liquid and things can't get through the liquid. And so there are quite a lot of dangers in the use of uh, nanotechnology. So we're, uh, an institute we're creating here, we're going to study the possible toxic effects of nanotechnology, the dangers as well as the, uh, the, the powerful <coughs> aspects of nanotechnology. But a thousand carbon nanotubes could sit on top of one of today's transistors. So this is uh, saying that we have a technology here with which we can build the most quite incredible computers of the future. Um, a blood cell is uh, typically 7,400 different, different cells vary in size a lot. But if you've got something that size, you can put an awful lot of nanotechnology into something the size of a, a blood cell. And so we have the capability to get a blood cell in our body with a huge amount of computing and sensors, interacting by radio to the outside, uh, interacting by radio to other sensors or uh, nanobots, nan nanorobots in, in, in the body. Here's a picture of a neuron and an axon connecting to the neuron. There's a, a synapse in the brain. And here, drawn to scale, is a nanotechnology device. Uh, it, it's not a real one. I've just used it to, to, to draw it to scale on the diagram showing you how it compares in size with the neuron. And uh, now our brain, amazingly, has got 100 billion neurons. I like to be in parts of the world where I can look at the Milky Way at night and see all the incredible number of dots in the Milky Way. The Milky Way has got 100 billion stars like our sun in it. And the amazing thing, your brain has got the same number, 100, million, 100 billion neurons like that in the brain. And so brain scientists are now using the term BCI, Brain Computer Interface. What are the applications of connecting the brain in some way directly to electronic components or telecommunication components. And so here's a uh, nanotransponder in the brain uh, moving towards a neuron in the brain, and it's going to connect itself to that neuron, and the brain will then very quickly learn how to use this uh, new gadget. It's amazing how if you put a new gadget in your body, the brain can learn very quickly how to use that uh, new, new gadget. And um, so possibly uh, some people have a large number of uh, nanobots in, in their brain. And we have really no idea where that's going to lead to, just as when we first dreamed up <coughs> ARPANET or packet switching or the internet, we had no idea really what the internet would lead to. We needed an awful lot of inventive speculation to try and uh, imagine what the future of the internet was going to be. Well, it needs an awful lot of imaginative speculation to uh, work out what the future of nanotechnology in, in the body is going to be. But uh, it's almost certainly going to lead to various things which we call transhumanism. And transhumanism means that we're changing the human being. And there are various ways to change the human being. Probably one of the most important is re regenerative medicine with uh, stem cells. And the early changes which will happen is we will change the human being so that it's healthier. And that you can live longer. <coughs> I tell my daughter that if she has children, there's a good chance now that they will live to be 120 good chance that her children will have a life expectancy of 120. But that wouldn't be very pleasant if the, first, if the last 40 years of their life was in a wheelchair. And so if you're going to get people to live to a very old age, then you need the capability to rebuild the aging tissues. And so uh, uh, regenerative medicine is very important. 
And one of the most exciting aspects of regenerative medicine is to regenerate the immune system. Your immune system is so complex. Scientists don't really understand how it works today. And when you get to my age, your immune system seems to wear out in, in various ways. And the one or two companies in California now that are in the business of taking an old person's immune system and using embryonic stem cells to create a young immune system with that person's DNA. So you can put it back into the bone marrow where it, it multiplies so you have the capability to build a, uh, a new and very effective immune system in uh, an, an aging person. And that's going to be a very important aspect of enabling people to grow older. Anyway, a lot of other subjects which are transhumanism, some of them very powerful, and uh, it's, a, it's a colossal subject, so many different ways of changing the human being. And again, I don't want to lecture on that subject, otherwise we'd be here for five days. So let, let me go on to other things. Advanced computer intelligence. Now, a lot of computer intelligence will be totally unlike human intelligence. Almost all of the computer intelligence we've got today, we've got three types of thinking. We've got human thought, and we've got the pro programming of human thought, <coughs> automation of human thought. And that is what nearly all software is doing today. It's taking the way that humans think and it's putting that into code, very often a crude coding language like C++ and uh, the automation of human thought. But we can do something quite different and that is to create thought which the human brain couldn't do, non-human thought. And uh, the artificial intelligence laboratories are full of different attempts to do that, very different in, in what they look like. Uh, some of them uh, do it by recognizing patterns that humans can't recognize. And you can create uh, non-human-like non intelligence where it has the capability to improve its own intelligence. You may give it a goal, like Darwinism, and it has the capability to uh, uh, try different uh, variations until it progresses <coughs> towards that goal. Progresses by trial and error, like Darwinism. But it's not Darwinism, because Darwinism is randomless, in Dawkins' word, godless. It's a random number process for trying all sorts of random mutations. Well, we will be trying mutations which have a goal in mind. And of all the mutations we try, maybe um, uh, 999 out of 1,000 would fail. But you get one in 1,000 which improves the progress towards that goal. So then you change the algorithm and do it again. And so we have a, a thing like Darwinism, which is highly intelligent and uh, uses uh, computer thought in a way that's totally, utterly different from, from human thought. Anyway, very interesting subject. And eventually where we have computers making themselves intelligent automatically, they're going to do it very fast. So you're going to get the capability to have uh, computer thought millions of times more powerful than human thought. So extreme computing is probably going to lead to the era of the fastest wealth generation in, in human history. And uh, if we did uh, destroy the planet, if the uh, overall planet was warmed by uh, four degrees, then parts, as you see on that diagram, are much hotter than other parts. And uh, now, in some cases, it would be quite beneficial to have hotter parts. To, to grow masses of grain, you need a huge breadbasket area like uh, the uh, cornfields of North America. And uh, North America's got the, the greatest breadbasket in the world today. But if that section of the planet got two degrees warmer, the largest breadbasket in the world would probably be Russia. And Russia is absolutely huge. It, it spans 11 time zones. And if you look at the area just under Siberia, you've got a belt there of about 500 miles or so, where the soil is very good, but the farming is absolutely terrible. They're mostly growing weeds. Very, very few farmers, a few village farmers there. And uh, now get the temperature there a little bit higher, uh, make sure you've got enough water, make sure you've got good management put into place. And I, I've just been in Russia, where there was a fascinating conference there in which they were asking, how can Russia make itself into a great country 20 years from now? What are the products that Russia needs to aim at? What are the changes in Russian society, Russian technology, Russian universities to make Russia a truly great country 20 years from now? And one, one of the things they were saying there is, is Russia can have the largest breadbasket in the world by changing, changing its farming methods. And uh, so that's uh, interesting. Russia may be a very different world. Uh, uh, this leads us to ask questions about uh, civilization itself. What, what is civilization going to look like if we uh, create all of these new types of technology? Is it going to be a civilization that is uh, uh, interesting? Certainly it's going to get highly complex. Probably one of the 
characteristics of civilization in the future is we're going to have the capability to um, do away with most drudgery work. Drudgery work can be done with, by computers. Boring work, dirty work, increasingly will be done by computers, robots, nanotechnology, nanobots, and so on. And if robots do most of that work, what are humans going to do? Well, they're going to do those things which are uniquely human, those things which humans can do which computers are not good at doing. And probably what's going to happen is we're going to have an extremely high level of creativity. So if I were to guess what the, how the world is really fundamentally going to look different uh, 50 years from now, it would be immensely more creative than today because most people won't have to destroy their lives by uh, learning how to do drudgery work. Much of the drudgery work will be done by machines. So even if we damage the planet in very bad ways, probably the rich are going to be okay. They're going to build new cities in uh, new places, cool cities in cool locations. And uh, the uh, uh, types of cities uh, probably have a very high quality of life, um, not with carbon-based fuels. I like to use the term eco-affluence. What I mean by that is new and different types of affluence, uh, which cause people to have a very enjoyable life, many of them different from life today. But eco-affluence, meaning that the new type of affluence doesn't pump carbon into the atmosphere or doesn't damage the uh, ecology of the Earth. And there are just an absolutely enormous number of different potential types of eco-affluence. So wealth, wealth in the 21st century, then, uh, the wealth of America probably, if, if uh, the American economy goes up by 2.5% per year in real terms, you multiply that out, and it uh, is to 12 times in a century. And it's, that seems a reasonable goal for the American economy. And if they achieve that goal, then uh, America will be uh, 12 times richer in real terms than it is at the beginning of the century. Now, how would it spend that money? And that, that is really one of the big questions that's difficult for us to address. In China, China, starting from a very much smaller base, will probably be about 24 times richer by the end of the century. The European Union, I would think, probably something like 12 times. And, of course, these, these numbers are guesses. But they're intelligent guesses. They're looking at the probable rate at which the European Union, for example, can grow its economy <coughs> as, as it grows through the century. And they all lead to the same question. You're talking about enormous wealth, extraordinary wealth. How are you going to spend that money? How is society going to change when you become that wealthy? Well, certainly eco-affluent wealth and near infinite number of complex avocations. What can those avocations look like? So at the time when we discuss the big problems of the planet, we should also be looking at the big opportunities and asking very fundamental questions about what sort of a world do you want your children to live in? What sort of sense of values? Do you want your children to live in a world with Nick Bostrom's sense of values, for example? Or do you want something different from that? And so these are very interesting, the affluent number of complex uh, Avocation. So we can say, what, what would be the greatest characteristics of civilization in the future? Uh, historians look back into the past and say there have been certain times of absolute greatness in Athens in the time of Pericles, an extraordinary civilization. Um, Florence in the time of Michelangelo, extraordinary civilization. Um, London in the time of Shakespeare. The, the theatres really hadn't been built until about uh, 1550 or so. And then suddenly in London you got all sorts of playwrights, amazing playwrights, uh, uh, like Marlowe writing Tamburlaine, and uh, all of the playwrights of London have been to Oxford or Cambridge. And then there was one person who was fascinated by this who came in from the outside, not as a playwright, as an actor, and that was Shakespeare. And one of the things you never did at that time in the theatre, it just was one of those things you don't do, was to change from being an actor to being a, a, a writer of plays. And Shakespeare started to do that, and he got intense criticism. The critics referred to this upstart crow. Crow meaning actor. Made beauteous by our feathers. And, of course, uh, you know what happened to Shakespeare. And uh, so L London, if you're interested in the theatre, <coughs> from about 15... 16 until about uh, 1610 must have been the most extraordinary civilization to live in. So, so much happening, Bo boiling over with this new type of activity. Paris in the time of Voltaire. And uh, so we can look at the society we're talking about here and say, is, is this just going to be a trivial society in which we just dance and listen to cheap music? Or is it going to be a society in which we have extraordinarily complex avocations interesting things to do as we move into the world where we don't need to do the drudgery work that so many human beings are doing today. 
So an interesting question about the uh, future. So a future with extreme bandwidth. The culture is becoming worldwide because of the extreme global bandwidth, uh, near infinite computing. Uh, hydroponics, you don't want to grow grain crops with hydroponics, but just about everything else. The vitamin crops, the fruit uh, can be grown with hydroponics better than it can be grown in soil. And there are some wonderful examples of early hydroponics farms in existence today. And uh, one of the characteristics is they don't really work unless you've got extreme discipline. And this rules them out in many areas because not many farmers have extreme discipline. And so what extreme discipline is going to translate into, the big hydroponics farms are having a massive effect on growing the vitamin crops, the fruit crops, and so on. The gourmet crops have got to be largely controlled by computers, because computers can have extreme discipline, which most farmers haven't got. The most beautiful strawberries in the world are strawberries that are grown uh, entirely artificially in uh, hydroponics, and the same with many other things. Uh, trains, the uh, maglev train never touches the tracks, and uh, we've already got one train which is running, uh, one of the biggest airports in the world is Shanghai. And from Shanghai Airport, you can get into the downtown Shanghai in about six minutes in a train which travels at 440 kilometers per hour. And uh, so very fast trains. Fusion uh, is a fundamentally new type of getting energy. If we once crack the problem of fusion, then we're going to have an almost infinite supply of energy which doesn't cause the global warming. And so future civilizations, lots of statements we could make about them, transhumanism, it must have synergy with, with nature, um, maximum cultural diversity, uh, beauty. And so we could be asking the question, what, to, what, what types of civilization like that are we going to build? I don't know whether you saw James Lovelock's article in The Guardian a week ago, uh, but James Lovelock seems to be getting more depressing, more Malthus-like, uh, as, he, as he gets older. He's, he's 88, quite remarkable intellect. I mean, it's like a, an 88-year-old kid. And uh, what, he was, uh, what he's now saying is that by the end of the century, if we go on with business as usual, go on like we are doing now, the Earth won't be able to support more than 500 million people. <coughs> well, if the population of the Earth is 9 billion by mid-century and you go down to uh, half a billion by the end of the century, what on Earth is going to happen to people? And I think a good part of the answer to that question is Lovelock is wrong. He's failed to understand the uh, ingenuity with which we can build new cities, new places to live, new types of food, uh, ways to overcome the problems. Yes, we may uh, do a lot to wreck the planet. We will pump too much carbon into the atmosphere, We're doing an enormous amount of damage, but it's not going to be as bad as what he's talking about. So um, Lovelock's world... If you have fish in a pond and they overbreed, which they always do, then they reach a point where suddenly the population drops in 12 months to about one-tenth of what it was. And Lovelock is saying, that's going to happen to us. Uh, I think most people say, it's not going to happen to us because we're not like fish. We're more intelligent than fish. And we'll build all sorts of things for surviving. A really beautiful example of that is in Taiwan. In Taiwan, the fertility rate was 8 in uh, 1990. And now the fertility rate is 0.7. The average woman in Taiwan has 0 0.7 children. And they have a much better life. Why do they have so few children? Well, because they want to earn a lot of money. There are lots of ways in Taiwan to earn lo lots of money. Uh, it has uh, huge hedge funds and things like that, uh, which pay uh, very high prices. And so many of the uh, women in Taiwan, all the, all the women in Taiwan now, uh, can, can read and they're uh, well educated. And many of them have the capability to earn high salaries, so they get married late. And when they get married, uh, they're late having a child. They very often only have one child. So here you've got that solution. If the whole world was like Taiwan, the population would drop to well below a billion by the end of the century. Uh, and women would, most women would have a much better life than the life which they've got today. So we have win-win <laughs> solutions like that, which we need to search for and say, uh, if we understand these solutions, what can we do to increase the probability of them actually happening? Knowledge capability, uh, that's been defined as the amount of digitized knowledge uh, multiplied by the capability to process knowledge. Now, the capability to process knowledge is increasing by more. Well. It's doubling uh, about every 18 months. The sheer amount of knowledge that we've got available to us is increasing at a, a furious rate. If you just look at the mapping of DNA, for example, uh, in 1990, uh, the prevailing view is that it will be impossible to map the whole human genome. 
1995, the US government started a project to map the human genome in 10 years. 1998, uh, Maverick Craig Venter, with the new use of uh, supercomputers, set out to map the human genome, and he finished it before the American government in, t in 2000. And today we have people in Oxford who are saying it to me this week, we have techniques with which we can map the human genome in one hour. And uh, while this is uh, going on with the human genome, laboratories are uh, mapping the genomes of pathogens, they're mapping the uh, trees of every creature on the planet, uh, trees, uh, every, everything else. Meanwhile, uh, Craig Venter, about three weeks ago, announced that he, for the first time, created artificial life. <laughs> he designed life on a computer screen, and they'd put the, the base pairs together, and they created a, a living creature, a microbe. This was the first time a living creature had been made by human beings. Now, where's that going to lead to? Is the Pope going to say that that is a new uh, deadly sin? Who, who knows? But anyway, multiply those two together, and what it's saying is the uh, knowledge capability is approximately doubling every year, and it's certainly going to go on doing that for the rest of your lifetime. If the rest of your lifetime is uh, 90 uh, years, that is 2 to the power of 90, and that is an incredibly large number. Large number, we, we cannot conceive of really what a, a number of that size means. So what this is saying is, this is an absolutely extraordinary century. So much of our new technology is intellect intensive, and we've got the capability to multiply the intellect, grow the intellect, at absolutely staggering rates. So the 21st century is quite different from any other century in the past. We've got huge problems, we've got to learn to solve those problems, and at the same time, we've got opportunities to do things which are quite extraordinary in their nature. And computers are likely to become more and more powerful until we have computer intelligence growing uh, at an almost vertical rate, like inflation in Zimbabwe. And what's going to happen if you have computer in in intelligence growing at an almost vertical rate on the curve? We refer to that as the singularity. And what's it going to do to humankind? What's it going to do to jobs? What's it going to do to the economy? Again, it looks like a discontinuity in uh, the, the affairs of man. Now, we could have the capability to really take advantage of that and solve the problems of the third world, close down the shanty towns, get education into the third world. But if we go on like we are doing today, what will happen is that you'll have uneducated digital nations of un highly educated digital nations of unbelievable wealth, and you'll have uneducated analog nations of utterly unspeakable poverty, as we've got today, but becoming much worse than they are today. And that could lead to a situation where uh, war, conflict is uh, a possibility. So having an institute to say, how do we spot uh, uh, conflicts which could turn into war? How do we stop them? What are the mechanisms by which we can achieve conflict resolution? Very important subject in the 21st century, and I think we're going to have a fabulous institute on that subject uh, as part of our change to second gear. This was the first hydrogen bomb ever. The Americans gave it a nice friendly name. They called it Mike. And amazingly, the mushroom cloud, the stem of the mushroom cloud was 20 miles across. So an absolute monster of a weapon. And by um, 1983, we got 70,000 uh, nuclear weapons. You could destroy the whole planet with a thousand nuclear weapons, but somehow or other we managed between us and the USSR to create uh, 70,000 nuclear weapons. And they had to be totally automated. The launch had to be completely automated. It eventually got to a state where there was only one way for the USSR to attack us or vice versa, and that was to, uh, you know, the, what Americans believe is that you don't start a, uh, a nuclear war unless the president presses the button. What it said in the Soviet strategy books, which we can read now, is target number one is the US president. Before you do anything else, you delete him. The president of France, two, two presidents of France made a speech on television to the public saying, we won't use the force to frap unless I, the president, personally press the button. And you can read the manuals of the other side. It's okay, if we ever attack France, target number one. He, he, he's what goes first. There's a wonderful story which... Uh, Sir Crispin Tickell uh, tells about he was in a, a diplomatic uh, event one day and uh, uh, President Reagan was there and President Reagan said, look, what's that uh, red case, that briefcase over there? And Sir Crispin Tickell, well, I believe it's the uh, thing which they, they call the button for, that contains all the nuclear codes for France. Uh, and Reagan said, well, where's 
Where's the French Prime Minister? Well, well he's gone to the manager. And, and President Reagan said, let's steal it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this was the sort of insanity that we built up in the nuclear weapons. Anyway, given those weapons and the, the utter unspeakable ability to utterly destroy civilization, we've reached a paradigm shift, which is perhaps the biggest paradigm shift in history. From now on, we can either have no war <coughs> between high-tech nations or else we'll have no civilization. And this is a pretty absolute statement. Either no, no war between high-tech nations or no civilization. Now, how, how do you cope with paradigm shift like this? I, I try to discuss this with historians and they just look at me rather blankly and, and uh, don't really um, have, have very interesting comments to say about what is probably the biggest paradigm shift ever in our lifetime. And uh, this would be true just with nuclear weapons. But we're now getting weapons which are conventional weapons which are becoming incredibly powerful and incredibly accurate. And if you can have a conventional weapon which is half a ton of TNT and you can bring it down onto a target with GPS and the capability to uh, watch the image of the target so you bring it down right onto the target then that becomes as dangerous as, as nuclear weapons. And then we have biological weapons and uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the story about Australian mouse pox. There were a couple of kids in Australia who wanted to get rid of the mice. Australia has a real problem with mice. And so they got a mouse pox and they genetically modified it so that the mouse immune system could not detect it. And when they used that, it killed every single mouse that the pathogen got to. And the Americans were rather surprised. So they got a copy of this and they put it into a highly secure laboratory and they did the same thing. Every single mouse died. And so then people started to say, okay, could you take smallpox or could you take pathogens which affect the human system and genetically modify them so that the human immune system cannot detect the pathogen? And could you create a pathogen which, which uh, spreads very fast in lots of different ways, as Angela understands, to create a pathogen, rap rapidly spreading a pathogen? And once that again, again is saying, look, there's either going to be nothing like that, there'll either be no war between high-tech nations or there'll be no civilization. The civilizations which are quite different from the civilization of the 21st century, surely we don't want to build something that is consumerism gone to ridiculous extremes. Consumerism gone to much further extremes than consumerism in America today, for example. So what should be different? What should replace it? Anyway, we can Take the chart I started with, the um, 21st century nightmares, and one of the things we can say about them is this is an age of the most brilliant management ever. The best corporate management today is incredible. The management of air traffic control is incredible. And you can get a plane uh, uh, damaging an engine or something like that in uh, Indonesia, and uh, very quickly they uh, work out replacement, they put the passengers onto a different plane, they reschedule the crew, and they do this in such a way they maximize the profit for the airlines and the flying public never even know this happened. And this happens all day, all, all the time, every day, in the airlines of the world. Utterly brilliant management. And we have many other things of utterly brilliant management. But we're not applying this brilliant management to the big problems, the problems that will damage our children's lives. We're not applying the <coughs> brilliance, the genius of our management to that. Well, how do you change that? Well, you've got to find some way of motivating the people who are the brilliant management so that they don't just make their money out of hedge funds, they make their money out of stopping global warming and stopping the other dangers. So anyway, uh, the 20, 21 nightmares, here's a set of targets. Uh, the world ecology is uh, tightly managed. Excessive population growth we put into a place. When you teach women to read, they have fewer babies uh, on, on a pretty large scale. Uh, so it doesn't look difficult to drop the population of the planet to about 4 billion by the end of the century. Maybe we need to go lower than that. Uh, uh, save water, uh, lots of ways in which we can deal with the water situation I was describing. Um, ocean destruction is not really very difficult to save the oceans. It's a political management diplomatic question more than a technical question. Um, the, the millennial goals, do you remember the <coughs> millennial goals of uh, the year 2000? in which they said, by 2015, we want to halve the number of people earning one dollar a day. You know, you know a, a billion people, which is larger than the first world. The whole, the whole first world is less than a billion. And there are more than a billion people who earn only one dollar a day. And there are two billion who earn only two dollars a day. 
So the United Nations has put together a program <coughs> for saying, let's halve the number of people that own, uh, own one dollar and, and, and two dollars a day, and by 2015. And they're not quite going to make those goals, not quite make them, but they'll certainly go a long way towards doing them. So for all of the giant problems here, we can set targets, we can set goals, like the millennial goals, and so we ought to take the entire earth and say, what are the big problems of the earth? Let's translate that into numbers, let's set targets, and then ask questions about how can we meet those targets? And if we set targets for all the things we've got on this diagram here, we might refer to that as target earth, and that's the reason I use that uh, word. So solutions to solutions, solutions connected to measurements, connected to targets, where the whole earth has got this integrated set of targets. Incidentally, the targets for one subject relate to the targets for a different subject. Um, you know, if you want to reduce population, you teach women to read. You can't do that very well unless you've got done something about people are only earning one dollar a day, and so on. So the, the solutions relate to one another. So target Earth ought to be what the 21st century school is all about. We need to be asking the question, how can we make the world of our children much better than the world of the 21st century? How can we deal with the giant problems we're talking about? But as we deal with the giant problems, we've got enormous opportunities. How can we take advantage of the spectacular opportunities that we've got at the present time? So to target Earth, really the subject matter, in my view, for the 21st century school, and all those curves that we looked at, one thing those curves are saying is every industry needs to be radically reinvented. So you can take every single industry, you know, farming, entertainment, Hollywood, telecommunications industry, the car industry, every industry on the planet, and say, look, you've got to, it's wrong today, you've got to reinvent it, totally reinvent it. So you could say in detail how every industry needs reinventing. And once you say uh, what needs to be done, it's not very difficult to say how, what are the mechanisms, what are the management controls that you put into place for doing that. And at the same time we say every industry needs radically reinventing, Nick Bostrom would say every human being, human life needs radically uh, reinventing. Can you hear what he's saying? He's saying the world we're describing today is like a giant complex cathedral. Um, we're crouching in just one part of the cathedral, like frightened children, not daring to look at the enormous opportunities that we're confronted with. And uh, that's not what life is all about. What life is all about is understanding the great opportunities which confront us today and teaching them and putting into place the lifestyle for that, uh, where we have a, a century, what this century is all about is learning how to control what we're doing. Learning how to control what we're doing to a large extent is the meaning of the 21st century. We want to learn to control what we're doing in order that future centuries can be absolutely magnificent. Thank you.